Hello everyone and welcome to this coffee break course, KonMari at Work, based on the book Joy at Work by Marie Kondo and Scott Zonenshine. My name is Marshall Mockton, so uh, let's get started. Today's agenda, we'll be talking about why should we tidy, particularly at work, how to tidy your workspace and storage, tidying your digital work, tidying meetings, and how to spark more joy at work. So let's talk about it then. A tidy desk results in a higher evaluation of our character and capacity. This raises our self-esteem and increases our motivation. As a result, we work harder and our performance improves. So tidying up sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? Picture your workplace at this very moment and take a good look around you. Next, answer the following questions. Are you honestly feeling positive about working here right now? Does your working at this desk every day really spark joy for you? Are you sure that you're giving your full scope to your creativity? Do you really want to come back to this tomorrow? These questions aren't intended to make you feel bad. They are meant to help you get in touch with how you really feel about your work environment. So why tidy? Tidying helps you find a sense of purpose. I'm sure you have heard people say, I work to make a living, not to enjoy myself. But it seems such a shame to give up and work only out of obligation, making no effort to spark joy in our environment. Next to the home, work is where we spend most of our time. And at some point in our lives, we may even spend more time on the job than at home. Work is a precious part of life. While making good use of our skills, wouldn't it make sense to enjoy our time at work even a little? And if we're going to enjoy it, why not also work in a way that makes others around us feel happy? Most people who have succeeded in tidying up once and for all have done so out of their own initiative. They also start off with a clear idea of who they want to be and what kind of lifestyle they want. By contrast, people who launch into tidying without a clear idea of why they are doing it, or worse, with the hope that they can get someone else to do it for them, often revert to clutter, even if they succeed in tidying up the first time. So. Let me ask you now, why do you want to tidy up? If your answer is that you want to improve your work performance or eliminate stress, that's fine. But to keep yourself motivated, you'll need to be more precise at identifying clear, concrete terms, your ideal approach to work, and the effects you hope tidying will have on your life. So before you start, visualize your ideal work life. Imagining your day at work in concrete detail while asking yourself what kind of work life sparks joy for you and what values are important in your work is the first step to tidying and it's crucial to success. Only when you have set tidying goals based on a clear picture of your ideal work style can you approach tidying with the right kind of mindset. If it's a real challenge to make time for tidying, try splitting the process into several sessions. The most common pattern is to go to the office two hours before work starts and complete tidying in three two-hour sessions. Make sure to keep your tidying sessions close together so that you can maintain intensity and not drag out the process to the point where you have to keep starting over and over and over again. The important thing is to give yourself a deadline. But if you just tell yourself you'll tidy when you have time, you'll never finish. So tidy up properly, all in one go. Then designate a place for every single item. Once you know where everything in your workplace is stored, you can keep track of your things even when they start to multiply. That's what makes it possible to keep your space tidy. By learning the proper way to tidy up, Anyone can achieve a joyful space and never rebound. When tidying, remember these three categories. Things that directly spark joy, those that provide functional joy, and those that lead to future joy. These are your criteria for choosing what to keep in your workspace. For tidying up the workspace, use the order of books, papers, 
kimono, and finally, sentimental items. The KonMari method recommends this order because starting with the easiest and working up to the hardest category helps us to develop our capacity to choose what to keep or let go, and then decide where to store everything. When tidying up your books, begin by gathering them all in one spot. This means removing them from the bookshelf. Only by taking each one into your hands can you actually see them as separate entities. So, does this book spark joy for you? Books that spark joy are those that motivate and energize you when you read and reread them. Those that make you happy just to know they're there. Those that bring you up to date on the latest information. And those that help you in perf to perform better at work, such as manuals. In contrast, books that you bought on impulse, as well as that those that were gifts, but you doubt that you'll ever read, have definitely fulfilled their purpose the moment you bought or received them. So it's time to let them go with gratitude for the joy they have given you in the past. After books, the next category is papers. Start by gathering all your papers together in one spot and looking at each one. Papers are the only category that can't be selected by asking yourself if they spark joy. Instead, you must actually check the content. Even papers that are, in, that are in envelopes should be taken out and checked page by page just in case there are some advertising leaflets or other unwanted material uh, mixed in with them. Papers can be broadly divided into three categories. Pending, save because you have to, and save because you want to. But because rebound is a common problem when people hang on to things just because, Keep in mind that the basic rule for papers is to discard them all. Remember, even if you tidy up, papers are bound to pile up again quickly, making rebound inevitable. But there's no need to worry. As long as you follow the three rules of storage, you'll never return to paper clutter. Rule one, categorize every paper down to the last sheet. Rule two, store your papers upright. Rule three, make a pending box. Let's go on to kimono. Divide your kimono into subcategories. Common subcategories found in a typical workspace include office supplies, such as pens, scissors, staples, tape, etc. Electrical items, such as digital devices, gadgets, cords, things like that. Job-specific kimono, such as product samples, art materials, supplies, parts, and personal care items, such as cosmetics, medicine, supplements, things like that. And finally, food, such as tea, snacks, coffee, etc. So again, begin by gathering all the items in the same subcategory in one place and pick them up one by one. With desk supplies, you need only one of each item in your workspace. To, so just go ahead and select one and say goodbye to the rest. If your company has a supply storage area or a communal workspace, you can put them there. Consumables are things like sticky notes, paper clips, notebooks, stationery, and cards. Although we may need to keep a few extra in stock, think about how many of each you actually need at your desk and return the rest to wherever your company keeps office supplies. When tidying up electrical kimono, it's quite common to find broken appliances, gadgets, cords that are obsolete or you have no idea what they go to. There's only so much space to store things in your desk. So keep what you need and what you know works and say goodbye with gratitude to the rest. Job specific kimono are all those things that are unique to our professions. Precisely because these items are directly connected to our work, they have the most potential to spark joy in our lives once we start tidying and to keep us motivated to the very end. Pick up each item in this subcategory and ask yourself if it truly sparks joy. If you pay attention to your feelings, you should feel a surprisingly clear answer. Personal care items include hand cream, eye drops, supplements, and other things that help us perform our work with greater ease. Start by imagining your ideal work life. Then decide what kinds of personal care products will help you realize what I, 
help you realize that ideal workspace and what kind won't. Are you accumulating things like snacks, candy, gum at your desk? If so, check the expiration dates and set a limit on the number you will keep on hand from now on. This is your chance to say goodbye to a surplus stock and put your desk in order. Sentimental items are the hardest because it consists of things of sentimental value such as photos, letters. That's why it's left to the very end. As you tidy up all the other categories, you learn what you really value and hone your ability to choose what truly sparks joy. As with the other categories, start by gathering all the items together in one spot. Take each one in your hands and ask yourself, will this spark joy for me if I keep it at my desk right now? If your response is that it once supported you in your work but you no longer need it, be thankful for what it gave you and let it go with gratitude. If you have too many items that spark joy to keep them all at your desk, take some of them home. If you can speed up the process, if you put such take home items aside in a bag while you're tidying, please do so. But just remember to take the bag home when you're done. Once you've chosen only those things that spark joy, it's time to store them. There are three basic rules of storage. Rule one, designate a place to store each item and store by category. Rule two, use boxes and store things upright. Rule three, as a rule, don't store anything on the top of your desk. Now let's talk about your digital life. For most people, digital life has three main parts, digital documents, emails, and smartphone apps. All three share the same problem. It's all too easy to save everything. In order to get a handle on your digital life, go category by category, starting with documents, followed by emails, and finally smartphone apps. Start with the documents on your hard drive or network drive, which will contain most of your digital documents. Afterward, tackle your desktop. Examine each file and ask yourself, do I need this document to get my job done? Will this document provide me with guidance or inspiration for future work? Does this document spark joy? If the answer is no to all of these questions, delete the document. Create a handful of main folders to minimize the amount of thought that goes into where to put or find something. Usually three main folders is all you need. Current projects, records, which should contain policies and procedures you regularly access, and saved work which consists of documents from past projects that you'll use in the future. Your desktop should be a special place. So, transform your desktop into a place that helps you get your work done and sparks joy. The desktop can include pending documents. You also might wish to create a spark joy folder on your desktop. This might include files such as a research publication you're particularly proud of, a recent teaching evaluation, an inspirational video clip, or a favorite picture. And don't forget to select an inspiring wallpaper to provide a joyful backdrop. Research finds that the more time you spend on email, the lower your productivity and the higher your stress levels. So start with your inbox. When deciding whether to keep an email, ask yourself, do I need to keep this email to get my job done in the future? Well, reading this email, will reading this email again truly provide you with knowledge, inspiration, or motivation for future work? Does this email spark joy? Find an approach that makes sense for you and your job. As with digital documents, aim for a reasonable number of storage folders typically about 10 or fewer. Remember to process your emails on a daily basis. When new messages come in, shift from thinking that everything must be kept to thinking everything gets discarded, unless there's a really good reason to keep it. It's best to schedule email work in a few sittings each day, such as at the beginning and at the end of the day. You will find that something you thought you needed to respond to in the morning actually gets resolved by the end of the day. Using blocks of time for email will also minimize distractions and allow you to focus on the work that matters most to you. Let people who depend on you know your system. 
and provide another way for them to contact you for highly urgent items, so you aren't forced, forced to constantly be checking your email. The average person uses a smartphone 85 times a day, adding up to more than five hours. There's a reason for that. Many apps are specifically built to be addictive and can distract us from getting work done. First, ask yourself, is this app a requirement? Next, ask yourself, does this app help me work better? Lastly, ask yourself, does this app spark joy? Remember, don't make excuses to keep apps such as, I paid for that app, or one day it might come in handy. <laughs> If the app sparks joy, make sure to keep apps that you truly enjoy using and use on a regular basis. Now let's talk about meetings. There are two reasons why people usually don't want to attend any given meeting. Because it's disorganized or because it's not particularly relevant to their work. So what can you do? Frame them in ways that show you are interested in wanting to have a successful meeting. For meetings that you don't wish to attend, but perhaps must, ask yourself questions such as, how can I best contribute to the success of this meeting? How can I best prepare for this meeting? These give you a quick, low-risk way to get a sharper sense of your role during a meeting. And always try to best identify at least one thing you can learn from a meeting, however dreadful it might be. Remember, anyone can bring more joy to a meeting. Try your best to follow these six rules. Rule number one, show up. I mean really show up. <laughs> Sit up straight. Pull yourself close to the table and radiate positive energy. Rule number two, come prepared. If someone provided an agenda beforehand, make sure you're ready. Rule number three, put away your electronics. Seriously, it's rude and sends the message that the meeting is unimportant and unworthy of your attention. Rule number four, listen. Really listen. We should be able to learn from one another during meetings. Rule number five, speak up. There are times when you have unique information to share. Focus on advancing the conversation with new information, a different perspective, or putting the discussion back on track. Rule number six, do no harm. We're responsible adults. Blaming others, cutting them off, or self-promoting creates dysfunction. So, above all, support others. Instead of immediately rejecting what a person says, try improving upon it. Replace a no with a yes, and condition yourself to build upon their ideas. They will feel better, and you will too. But maybe you're a manager who regularly leads meetings. Run a tidy meeting. First, know what you want to accomplish. Secondly, think carefully about the participants. What's more important than having a full room of participants is having the right people in the room, which are those who have unique information to contribute or the authority to take action to make a decision. Thirdly, state the goals of the meeting in the invitation. That will help people decide if they are truly needed. Make sure the agenda contains enough details so that people can adequately prepare. Fourthly, encourage participation. Make it clear from the very start that your goal is to generate ideas from everyone. Avoid going around the table and asking each person to say something. Instead, ask everyone to jump in when they have anything new to add. Invite their active involvement with open-ended questions that foster debate and make it safe for everybody to speak freely. You can ask questions such as, what's another way to look at this problem? What blind spots should we look out for? How will our customers and employees or other constituents feel? Fifthly, set timelines for meetings. 30 and 60 minutes are common because they are round numbers, but other than that, there's really no logic to them. Try reducing existing meetings by 15 minute increments until you find that you are actually too short on time. And remember, although overly long meetings can sap our energy, be careful not to replace them with more frequent short meetings. Most people readily say yes to short meeting requests, but short meetings can be almost as costly as long ones. 
Finally, just as a meeting needs a purpose and an agenda, it also needs a recap. A recap should help people understand why their time has been well spent. Ask questions such as, what progress did we make? What got in the way? What did we learn? And what did we solve? Imagine meetings that are energizing, ones that you actually look forward to attending. They make progress on prized projects and sometimes even end early. This vision is within your reach if you do your part to tidy meetings. Help everyone start experiencing more joy in the conference room. By organizing your work, you've given yourself a gift that goes far beyond a tidy desk, orderly calendar, or a clean inbox. You've taken back some control of your work life. So what's next? Sharing the magic of tidying with others. Firstly, let your tidiness inspire others by sharing all that you've accomplished. Invite colleagues to check out your workspace. Talk about your approach to managing your email and calendar. Show off your smartphone and computer desktop. Keep building high quality connections and people will be moved to make their own. Secondly, show care for your workspace. Ask yourself, what small things can I do to show care for my workplace? It could be as simple as occasionally cleaning up the kitchen. If a meeting is turning into a mess, think what you can say to get it back on track. If an email chain has gotten out of control, how can you refocus it? Thirdly, treasure your coworkers. On a scale of one to five, how much do you really express thanks to others? Recognize others' important contributions. Honor, make space for, and encourage people to be themselves. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Treat others as worthy of your respect. Now, add up your score, and if it totals less than 20, you've got room to improve. Remember to always acknowledge others' presence. Listen, speak candidly, and just treat everyone you encounter as a person worthy of your respect and recognition. Help create an environment that respects everybody by exemplifying a key lesson from tidying. Be grateful. There are many, many more ideas within the book Joy at Work by Marie Kondo and Scott Zonenshine. I highly encourage you to dive into this book and enjoy its many lessons on sparking joy. Otherwise, my name is Marcel Mockton and I thank you for your attention today. I look forward to your feedback in the form of pictures of your new tidied workspaces and success stories. Take care. Bye for now.